The Lighthouse Keeper of Aspinwall On a time, it happened that the lighthouse keeper in Aspinwall, not far from Panama, disappeared without a trace. Since he disappeared during a storm, it was supposed that the ill-fated man went to the very edge of the small rocky island on which the lighthouse stood and was swept out by a wave. This supposition seemed the more likely as his boat was not found next day in its rocky niche. The place of the lighthouse keeper had become vacant. It was necessary to fill this place at the earliest moment possible, since the lighthouse had no small significance for the local movement, as well as for vessels going from New York to Panama. Mosquito Bay abounds in sandbars and banks. Among these, navigation, even in the daytime, is difficult, but at night, especially with the fogs which are so frequent on these waters warmed by the sun of the tropics it is nearly impossible the only guide at that time for the numerous vessels is the lighthouse the task of finding a new keeper fell to the united states consul living in panama and this task was no small one first because it was absolutely necessary to find the man within twelve hours second the man must be unusually conscientious it was not possible, of course, to take the first comer at random. Finally, there was an utter lack of candidates. Life on a tower is uncommonly difficult, and by no means enticing to people of the South who love idleness and the freedom of a vagrant life. The lighthouse keeper is almost a prisoner. He cannot leave his rocky island except on Sundays. A boat from Aspinwall brings him provisions and water once a day, and returns immediately. On the whole island, one acre in area, there is no inhabitant. The keeper lives in the lighthouse, he keeps it in order. During the day he gives signals by displaying flags of various colours to indicate changes of the barometer. In the evening he lights the lantern. This would be no great labour were it not that to reach the lantern at the summit of the tower he must pass over more than 400 steep and very high steps. Sometimes he must make this journey repeatedly during the day. In general, it is the life of a monk, and indeed more than that, the life of a hermit. It was not wonderful, therefore, that Mr. Isaac Falconbridge was in no small anxiety as to where he should find a permanent successor to the recent keeper, and it is easy to understand his joy when a successor announced himself most unexpectedly on that very day. He was a man already old, seventy years or more, but fresh, erect, with movements and bearings of a soldier. His hair was perfectly white, his face as dark as that of a creole, but, judging from his blue eyes, he did not belong to a people of the South. His face was somewhat downcast and sad, but honest. At the first glance, he pleased Falconbridge. It remained only to examine him. Therefore, the following conversation began. Where are you from? I am a Pole. Where have you worked up to this time? In one place and another? A lighthouse keeper should like to stay in one place. I need rest. Have you served? Have you testimonials of honourable government service? The old man drew from his bosom a piece of faded silk, resembling a strip of an old flag, unwound it and said, Here are the testimonials. I received this cross in 1830. This second one is Spanish from the Carlist War, the third is the French Legion, the fourth I received in Hungary, afterward I fought in the States against the South, there they do not give crosses. Falconbridge took the paper and began to read. Hmm, Skavinsky, is that your name? Hmm, two flags captured in the bayonet attack. You were a gallant soldier. I am able to be a conscientious lighthouse keeper. It is necessary to ascend the tower a number of times daily. Have you sound legs? I crossed the plains on foot. The immense steps between the east and the California are called the plains. Do you know sea service? I served three years in a whaler. You have tried various occupations. The only one I have not known is quiet. Why is that? The old man shrugged his shoulders. Such is my fate. Still, you seem to me too old for a lighthouse keeper. Sir, exclaimed the candidate suddenly in a voice of emotion. I am greatly wearied, knocked about. I have passed through much, as you see. This place is one of those which I have wished for most ardently. I am old, I need rest. I need to say to myself, here you will remain. This is your port. 
Ah, sir, this depends now on you alone. Another time, perhaps, such a place will not offer itself. What luck that I was in Panama. I entreat you, as God is dear to me. I am like a ship which, if it misses the harbour, will be lost. If you wish to make an old man happy, I swear to you that I am honest, but I have enough of wandering. The blue eyes of the old man expressed such earnest entreaty that Falconbridge, who had a good, simple heart, was touched. Well, said he, I take you. You are a lighthouse keeper. The old man's face gleamed with inexpressible joy. I thank you. Can you go to the tower today? I can. Then goodbye. Another word. For any failure in service, you will be dismissed. All right. That same evening, when the sun had descended on the other side of the isthmus and a day of sunshine was followed by a night without twilight, the new keeper was in his place, evidently, for the lighthouse was casting its bright rays on the water as usual. The night was perfectly calm, silent, genuinely tropical, filled with a transparent haze, forming around the moon a great coloured rainbow with soft and broken edges. The sea was moving only because the tide raised it. Skivinsky on the balcony seemed from below like a small black point. He tried to collect his thoughts and take in his new position, but his mind was under too much pressure to move with regularity. He felt somewhat as a hunted beast feels when at last it has found refuge from pursuit on some inaccessible rock or inner cave. There had come to him, finally, an hour of quiet. The feeling of safety filled his soul with a certain unspeakable bliss. Now, on that rock, he can simply laugh at his previous wanderings, his misfortunes and failures. He was, in truth, like a ship whose masts, ropes and sails had been broken and rent by a tempest and cast from the clouds to the bottom of the sea, a ship on which the tempest had hurled waves and spat foam, but which still wound its way to the harbour, but which still wound its way to the harbour. The pictures of that storm passed quickly through his mind as he compared it with the calm future now beginning. A part of his wonderful adventures he had related to Falconbridge. He had not mentioned, however, thousands of other incidents. It had been his misfortune that, as often as he pitched his tent and fixed his fireplace to settle down permanently, some wind tore out the stakes of his tent, whirled away the fire and bore him on toward destruction. Looking now from the balcony of the tower at the illuminated waves, he remembered everything through which he had passed. He had campaigned in the four parts of the world and, in wandering, had tried almost every occupation. Labour-loving and honest, more than once he had earned money and had always lost it in spite of every provision and the utmost caution. He had been a gold miner in Australia, a diamond digger in Africa, a rifleman in public service in the East Indies. He established a ranch in California. The drought ruined him. He tried trading with wild tribes in the interior of Brazil. His raft was wrecked on the Amazon. He himself, alone weaponless and nearly naked, wandered in the forest for many weeks, living on wild fruits, exposed every moment to death from the jaws of wild beasts. He established a forge in Helmer, Arkansas, and was burned in a great fire which consumed the whole town. Next, he fell into the hands of Indians in the Rocky Mountains, and only through a miracle was he saved by Canadian trappers. Then he served as a sailor in a vessel running between Bahia and Bordeaux, and as a harpooner on a whaling ship. Both vessels were wrecked. He had a cigar factory in Havana, and was robbed by his partner while he himself was lying sick with the vomito. At last he came to Aspinwall, and there was to be the end of his failures, for what could reach him on that rocky island? Neither water, nor fire, nor men. But from men, Skivinsky had not suffered much. He had met good men oftener than bad ones. But it seemed to him that all the four elements were persecuting him. Those who knew him said he had no luck, and with that they explained everything. He himself became somewhat of a monomaniac, he believed that some mighty and vengeful hand was pursuing him everywhere on all lands and waters. He did not like, however, to speak of this. Only at times when someone asked him whose hand that it could be, 
He pointed mysteriously to the polar star and says, it comes from that place. In reality, his failures were so continuous that they were wonderful and might easily drive a nail into the head, especially of the man who had experienced them. But Skavinsky had the patience of an Indian and that great calm power of resistance which comes from truth of heart. In his time, he had received in Hungary a number of bayonet thrusts because he would not grasp the stirrup which was shown as a means of salvation to him and cry for quarter. In like manner, he did not bend to misfortune. He crept up against the mountain as industriously as an ant. Pushed down a hundred times, he began his journey calmly for the hundred and first time. He was in his way a most peculiar original, this old soldier, tempered, God knows in how many fires, hardened in suffering, hammered and forged. He was in his way a most peculiar original, this old soldier, tempered, God knows in how many fires, hardened in suffering, hammered and forged, had the heart of a child. In the time of the epidemic in Cuba, the vomito attacked him because he had given to the sick ill all his quinine, of which he had a considerable supply, and left not a grain to himself. There had been in him also this wonderful quality, that after so many disappointments he was ever full of confidence, and did not lose hope that all would be well yet. In winter he grew lively and predicted great events. He waited for these events with impatience and lived with the thought of them the whole summers. But the winters passed one after another and Skavinsky lived only to this, that they, whit that they whitened his head. At last he grew old, began to lose energy. His endurance was becoming more and more like resignation. His former calmness... His former calmness, his, for, his former calmness was tending towards supersensitiveness, and that tempered soldier was degenerating into a man ready to shed tears for any cause. Besides this, from time to time he was weighed down by a terrible homesickness which was roused by any circumstance. The sight of the, the sight of swallows. Grey birds like sparrows, snow on the mountains, or melancholy music like that heard in the past. Finally, there was one idea which mastered him, the idea of rest. It mastered the old man thoroughly, and swallowed all other desires and hopes. This ceaseless wanderer could not imagine anything more to be longed for, anything more precious than a quiet corner in which to rest and wait in silence for the end. Perhaps especially because some whim of fate had so hurried him over all seas and lands that he could hardly catch his breath, did he imagine that the highest human happiness was simply not to wander. It is true that such modest happiness was his due, but he was so accustomed to disappointments that he thought of rest as people in general think of something which is beyond reach. He did not dare to hope for it. Meanwhile, unexpectedly, in the course of twelve hours he had gained a position which was as if chosen for him out of all the world. We are not to wonder, then, that when he lighted his lantern in the evening he became, as it were, dazed, that he asked himself if that was reality, and he did not dare to answer that it was. But at the same time, reality convinced him with incontrovertible proofs. Hence hours one after another passed, while he was on the balcony. He gazed and convinced himself. It might seem that he was looking at the sea for the first time in his life. The lens of the lantern cast into the darkness an enormous triangle of light, beyond which the eye of the old man was lost in the black distance completely, in the distance mysterious and awful. But that distance seemed to run toward the light. The long waves following one another rolled out from the darkness and went bellowing toward the base of the island. And then their foaming backs were visible, shining rose-coloured in the light of the lantern. The incoming tide swelled more and more and covered the sandy bars. The mysterious speech of the ocean came with a fullness more powerful and louder, at one time like the thunder of cannon, at another like the roar of great forests. 
at another like the distant dull sounds of the voices of people. At moments it was quiet, then to the ears of the old man came some great sigh, then a kind of sobbing, and again threatening outbursts. At last the wind bore away the haze, but brought back broken clouds which hid the moon. From the west it began to blow more and more. The waves sprang with rage against the rock of the lighthouse, licking with foam the foundation walls. In the distance a storm was beginning to bellow. On the dark, disturbed expanse certain green lanterns gleamed from the masts of ships. Those green points rose high and then sank. Now they swayed to the right and now to the left. Skavinsky descended to his room. The storm began to howl. Outside, people on those ships were struggling with night, with darkness, with waves. But inside the tower it was calm and still. Even the sounds of the storm hardly came through the thick walls, and only the measured tick-tack of the clock lulled the weary old man to his slumber. Hours, days and weeks began to pass. Sailors assert that sometimes when the sea is greatly roused, something from out of the midst of night and darkness calls them by name. If the infinity of the sea may call out thus, perhaps when a man is growing old, calls come to him too from another infinity still darker and more mysterious. And the more he is wearied by life, the dearer are those calls to him, but to hear them, quiet is needed. Besides, old age loves to put itself aside as if with a foreboding of the grave. The lighthouse had become for Skivinsky such a half-grave. Nothing is more monotonous than the life on a beacon tower. If young people consent to take up this service, they leave it after a time. Lighthouse keepers are generally men not young, gloomy and confined to themselves. If by chance one of them leaves his lighthouse and goes among men, he walks in the midst of them like a person roused from a deep slumber. On the tower there is a lack of minute impressions which in ordinary life teach men to adapt themselves to everything. All that a lighthouse keeper comes in contact with is gigantic and devoid of definitely outlined forms. The sky is one hole, the water is another. And between those two infinities, the soul of man is in loneliness. That is a life in which thought is continual meditation, and out of that meditation nothing rouses the keeper, not even his work. Day is like day as two beads in a rosary, unless changes of weather form the only variety. But Skavinsky felt more happiness than ever in life before. He rose with the dawn, took his breakfast, polished the lens, and then, sitting on the balcony, gazed into the distance of the water, and his eyes were never sated with the pictures which he saw before him. On the enormous turquoise ground of the ocean were to be seen generally flocks of swollen sails gleaming in the rays of the sun so brightly that the eyes were blinking before the excess of light. Sometimes the ships, favoured by the so-called trade winds, went in an extended line one from another, like a chain of sea mews or albatrosses. The red casks indicating the channel swayed on the light wave with a gentle movement. Among the sails appeared every afternoon gigantic greyish feather-like plumes of smoke. That was a steamer from New York which brought passengers and goods to Aspinwall, drawing behind it a frothy path of foam. On the other side of the balcony Skavinsky saw, as if on his palm, Aspinwall and his busy harbour, and in it a forest of masts, boats and craft. A little farther, white houses and the towers of the town. From the height of his tower, the small houses were like the nests of sea mews, the boats were like beetles, and the people moved around like small points on the white stone boulevard. From early morning, a light eastern breeze brought a confused hum of human life above which predominated the whistle of steamers. In the afternoon, six o'clock came. The movement in the harbour began to cease. The mews hid themselves in the rents in the cliffs. The waves grew feeble and became in a some sort lazy. And then on the land, on the sea and on the tower came a time of stillness unbroken by anything. The yellow sands from which the waves had fallen back glittered like golden stripes on the width of the waters. The body of the tower was outlined definitely in blue. Floods of sunbeams were poured from the sea on the water and the sands on the cliff. 
At that time a certain lassitude full of sweetness seized the old man. He felt that the rest which he was enjoying was excellent, and when he thought it would be continuous nothing was lacking to him. Skavinsky was intoxicated with, with his own happiness, and since a man adopts himself easily to improved conditions, he gained faith and confidence by degrees. For he thought that if men built houses for invalids, why should not God gather up at last his own invalids? Time passed and confirmed him in this conviction. The old man grew accustomed to his tower, to the lantern, to the rock, to the sandbars, to solitude. He grew accustomed also to the sea mews which hatched in the crevices of the rock and in the evening held meetings on the roof of the lighthouse. Skavinsky threw to them generally the remnants of his food and soon they grew tame and afterward, when he fed them, a real storm of white wings encircled him and the old man went among the birds like a shepherd amongst sheep. When the tide ebbed, he went to the low sandbanks on which he collected savoury periwinkles and beautiful pearl shells of the Nautilus, which receding waves had left on the sand. In the night, by the moonlight and the tower, he went to catch fish, which frequented the windings of the cliff in myriads. At last he was in love with his rocks and his treeless little island, grown over only with small thick parts exuding sticky resin. The distant views repaid him for the poverty of the island, however. During afternoon hours, when the air became very clear, he could see the whole isthmus covered with the richest vegetation. It seemed to Skavinsky at such times that he saw one gigantic garden, bunches of cocoa and an enormous moussa, combined, as it were, in luxurious tufted bouquets, right there behind the houses of Aspinwall. Farther on, between Aspenwall and Panama, was a great forest over which every morning and evening hung a reddish haze of exaltations, a real tropical forest with its feet in stagnant water, interlaced with the lianas and filled with the sound of one sea of gigantic orchids, palms, milk trees, iron trees, gum trees. Through the field glass, the old man could see not only trees and the broad leaves of bananas, but even legions of monkeys and great marboos and flocks of parrots. Rising at times like a rainbow cloud over the forest, Skavinsky knew such a forest well, for after being wrecked on the Amazon, he had wandered whole weeks amongst similar arches and thickets. He had seen how many dangers and deaths lie concealed under those wonderful and smiling exteriors. During the nights which he had spent in them, he heard close at hand the sepulchral voices of howling monkeys and the roaring of the jaguars. He saw gigantic serpents coiled like lianas on trees. He knew slumbering forest lakes full of torpedo fish and swarming with crocodiles. He knew under what a yoke man lives in those unexplored wildernesses in which are single leaves that exceed a man's size ten times. Wildernesses swarming with blood-drinking mosquitoes, tree leeches and gigantic poisonous spiders. He had experienced that forest life himself had witnessed it and had passed through it. Therefore, it gave him the greater enjoyment to look from his sight and gaze on those matters, admiring their beauty and be guarded from their treacherousness. His tower preserved him from every evil. He left it only for a few hours on Sunday. He put on his blue keeper's coat with silver buttons and hung his crosses on his breast. His milk-white head was raised with a certain pride when he heard at the door, while entering the church, the Creole say among themselves, We have an honourable lighthouse keeper and not a heretic, though he is a Yankee. But he returned straight away after mass to his island, and returned happy, for he had still no faith in the mainland. On Sunday, also, he read the Spanish newspaper he brought in the town, or the New York Herald, which he borrowed from Falconbridge, and he sought in it European news eagerly. The poor old heart in that lighthouse tower and in another hemisphere was beating yet for its birthplace. At times, too, when the boat brought his daily supplies and water to the island, he went down from the tower to talk with Johnson, the guard. But after a while he seemed to grow shy. He ceased to go to the town to read the papers and to go down to talk politics with Johnson. Whole weeks passed in this way so that no one saw him and he saw no one. 
the only signs that the old man was living were the disappearance of the provisions left on shore and the light of the lantern kindled every evening with the same regularity with which the sun rose in the morning from the waters of those regions. Evidently, the old man had become indifferent to the world. Homesickness was not the cause, but just this, that even homesickness had passed into resignation. The whole world began now and ended for Slavinsky on his island. He had grown accustomed to the thought that he would not leave the tower till his death, and he simply forgot that there was anything else beside it. Moreover, he had become a mystic. His mild blue eyes began to stare like the eyes of a child, and were as if fixed on something at a distance. In the presence of a surrounding uncommonly simple and great, the old man was losing the feeling of personality. He was ceasing to exist as an individual. He was becoming merged more and more in that environment. He felt only unconsciously. At last it seemed to him that the heavens, the water, his rock, the tower, the golden sandbanks and the swollen sails, the sea mews, the ebb and flow of the tide, all form a mighty unity, one enormous mysterious soul, that he is sinking in that mystery, and he feels that soul which lives and lulls itself. He sinks and is rocked, forgets himself, and, in that narrowing of his own individual existence, in that half-waking, half-sleeping, he has discovered a rest so great that it nearly resembles half-death. But the awakening came. On a certain day, when the boat brought water and a supply of provisions, Skibinski came down an hour later from the tower and saw that beside the usual cargo there was an additional package. On the outside of this package were postage stamps of the United States and the address Skibinski Esquire written on coarse canvas. The old man, with aroused curiosity, cut the canvas and saw books. He took one in his hand, looked at it, and put it back. Thereupon his hands began to tremble greatly. He covered his eyes as if he did not believe them. It seemed to him as if he were dreaming. The book was Polish. What did that mean? Who could have sent the book? Clearly, it did not occur to him at the first moment that in the beginning of his lighthouse career he had read in the Herald, borrowed from the consul, of the formation of a Polish society in New York, and had sent at once to that society half his month's salary, for which he had, moreover, no use on the tower. The society had sent him the books with thanks. The books came in the natural way, but at the first moment the old man could not seize those thoughts Polish books of Aspinwall, on his tower, amid his solitude, that was for him something uncommon, a certain breath from past times, a kind of miracle. Now, it seemed to him, as to those sailors in the night, that something was calling him by name with a voice greatly beloved and nearly forgotten. He sat for a while with closed eyes, and was almost certain that, when he opened them, the dream would be gone shone upon clearly by the afternoon sun, and on it was an open book. When the old man stretched his hand towards it again, he heard in the stillness the beating of his own heart. He looked. It was poetry. On the outside stood printed in great letters the title, underneath the name of the author. The name was not strange to Skavinsky. He saw that it belonged to the great poet, Mitskevich, whose productions he had read in 1830 in Paris. Afterward, when campaigning in Algiers and Spain, he had heard from his countrymen of the growing fame of the great seer, but he was so accustomed to the musket at that time that he took no book in hand. In 1849 he went to America, and in the adventurous life which he led he hardly ever met a Pole, and never a Polish book. With a greater eagerness, therefore, and with a livelier beating of the heart, did he turn to the title page. It seemed to him then that on this lonely rock some solemnity is about to take place. Indeed, it was a moment of great calm and silence. The clocks of Aston Wall were striking five in the afternoon. Not a cloud darkened the clear sky. Only a few sea mews were sailing through the air. The ocean was as if cradled to sleep. The waves on the shore stammered quietly, spreading softly on the sand. In the distance the white houses of Aspinall and the wonderful groups of palm were smiling. In truth, there was something there solemn, calm and full of dignity. 
Suddenly, in the midst of that calm of nature, was heard the trembling voice of the old man, who read aloud as if to understand himself better. Thou art like health, O my birthland, Lithuania. How much we should prize thee, he only can know who has lost thee. Thy beauty in perfect adornment this day, I see and describe, because I am yearning for thee. His voice failed Skavinsky. The letters began to dance before his eyes. Something broke in his breast and went like a wave from his heart, higher and higher, choking his voice and pressing his throat. A moment more, he controlled himself and read further. O oh, holy lady, who guardest bright Chernostopa, who shinest in Ostrobama and preservest the castle town of Rodjak with his trusty people, as thou didst give me back to health in childhood, when by my weeping mother placed beneath thy care, I raised my lifeless eyelids upward and straightway walked into thy holy threshold to thank God for the life restored thee. So, by our wonder, now restore us to the bosom of our birthplace. The swollen wave broke through the restraint of his will. The old man sobbed and threw himself on the ground. His milk-white hair was mingled with the sand of the sea. Forty years had passed since he had seen his country, and God knows how many since he had heard his native speech. And now that speech had come to him itself. It had sailed to him over the ocean and found him in solitude on another hemisphere. It's so loved, so dear, so beautiful. In the sobbing which shook him there was no pain, only a suddenly aroused immense love in the presence of which other things are as nothing. With that great weeping, he had simply implored forgiveness of that beloved one, set beside because he had grown so old, had become so accustomed to his solitary rock, and had so forgotten it that in him even longing had begun to disappear. But now it returned as if by a miracle. Therefore the heart leaped in him. Moments vanished one after another. He lay there continually. The mews flew over the lighthouse, crying as if alarmed for their old friend. The hour in which he fed them with the remnants of his food had come. Therefore, some of them flew down from the lighthouse to him. Then more and more came and began to pick and to shake their wings over his head. The sound of the wings roused him. He had wept his fill and now had a certain calm and brightness, but his eyes were as if inspired. He gave unwittingly all his provisions to the birds, which rushed at him with an uproar, and he himself took the book again. The sun had gone already behind the gardens and the forest of Panama, and was going slowly beyond the isthmus to the other ocean. But the Atlantic was full of light yet, in the open there was still perfect vision, therefore he read further. Now bear my longing soul to those forest slopes to those green meadows. At last the dusk obliterates the letters on the white paper, the dusk short as a twinkle. The old man rested his head on the rock and closed his eyes. Then, she who defends bright Chenastopha took his soul and transported it to those fields coloured by various grain. On the sky were burning yet those long stripes, red and golden, and on those brightnesses he was flying to beloved regions. The pine woods were sounding in his ears. The streams of his native place were murmuring. He saw everything as it was. Everything asked him, dust remember? He remembers. He sees broad fields, between the fields, woods and villages. It is night now. At this hour, his lantern usually illuminates the darkness of the sea, but now he is in his native village. His old head has dropped on his breast and he is dreaming. Pictures are passing before his eyes quickly and a little disorderly. He does not see the house in which he was born, for war had destroyed it. He does not see his father and mother, for they died when he was a child. But still the village is as if he had left it yesterday. The line of cottages with lights to the windows, the mound, the mill, the two ponds opposite each other, and thundering all night with a chorus of frogs. Once he had been on guard in that village all night, now that past stood before him in a series of views. He is an Ulan again, and he stands there at guard. At a distance is the public house. 
who looks with swimming eyes. There is a thundering and singing and shouting in the silence of the night with voices of fiddles and bass viols. Ooh ha, ooh ha, then the Ulans knock out fire with their horseshoes in it, and it is wearisome for him there on his horse. The hours drag on slowly, at last the lights are quenched. Now, as far as the eye reaches, there is mist, the mist impenetrable. Now the fog rises, evidently from the fields, and embraces the whole world with a whitish cloud. You could say a complete ocean, but that is fields. Soon the land rail will be heard in the darkness, and the bitterns will call from the reeds. The night is calm and cool, in truth a Polish night. In the distance, the pine wood is sounding without wind, like the roll of the sea. Soon dawn will whiten the east. In fact, the cocks are beginning to crow behind the hedges. One answers to another from cottage to cottage. The storks are screaming somewhere on high. The Ulan feels well and bright. Someone had spoken of a battle tomorrow. Hi! He will go on, like the others, with shouting, with fluttering of flaglets. The young blood is playing like a trumpet, though the night cools it. But it is dawning. Already night is growing pale. Out of the shadows come forests, the thicket, a row of cottages, the mill, the poplars. The well is squeaking like a metal banner on a tower. What a beloved land, beautiful in the rosy gleams of morning. Oh, the one land, the one land. Quiet, the watchful picket hears that someone is approaching. Of course, they are coming to relieve the guard. Suddenly, some voice is heard above Skavinsky. Here, old man, get up. What is the matter? The old man opens his eyes and looks with wonder at the person standing before him. The remnants of the dream visions struggle in his head with reality. At last the visions pale and vanish. Before him stands Johnson, the harbour guide. What's this? asked Johnson. Are you sick? No. You didn't light the lantern. You must leave your place. A vessel from St. Jerome was wrecked on the bar. It is lucky that no one was drowned or you would go to trial. Get into the boat with me. You'll hear the rest of the consulate. The old man grew pale. In fact, he had not lighted the lantern that night. A few days later, Skavinsky was seen on the deck of a steamer which was going from Aspinwall to New York. The poor man had lost his place. There opened before him new roads of wandering. The wind had torn that leaf away again to whirl it over lands and seas, to sport with it till satisfied. 